In this video, I'm going to show you what to look for when buying an E39 5 Series sedan. In this video, I'll be using my 2002 530i, and this is the six-cylinder version. Um, most of what I talk about today related to the drivetrain and engine will pertain to the six-cylinder 528i, the 525i, and the 530i. But you could loosely apply the rest of this uh, buying guide to the M5 and to the 540 as well. Uh, the body is the same. Uh, there's some suspension, drivetrain, and engine um, changes, obviously, on the V8 models. But if you're searching for an E39, this is a good place to start. Now, before you even get out to meet anyone and look at a car in person, 90% of the research happens at home behind the computer first. So let's go back to my house and I'll show you guys what are the first steps that I do when looking at a car and evaluating some cars on the market before you even go to meet up with anyone and look at a car in person. Now I'm going to show you guys something that I'm an expert on, which is sitting around wasting time searching for BMWs for sale on Craigslist. Now let's take a look at Craigslist here, and I'm going to take a look at some cars and see if we can find some E39s for sale. I have California here, Los Angeles pulled up. There always seems to be a lot of E39s for sale for some reason. 530i, 2001 to 2003. Update search. Now we've narrowed it down to not that many, maybe 12 listings. This one looks interesting. 530i, one owner in Burbank for 4,200. Now this one looks interesting as uh, has sport package, premium. Um, this is uh, 2002. White is an unusual color. And the first thing I notice when I look at this photo here is this looks like it is for sale at a small dealership, um, which is not that bad. Usually I like to buy from a private owner, but um, sometimes a small dealer is okay as well. And the first thing I notice here is the Style 5 two-piece BBS wheels. Um, you can see the nozzle sprayer here in the front bumper that indicates it has a cold weather package. Um, you can also notice the trim around the windows here is shadow line trim, it's black. If it was chrome, that would tell you that it's actually a base model and not the sport package. Although some people may have a base model that they changed out the trim or um, you know did a plasti dip or vinyl wrap, um, that could happen too. You can see all these other BMWs here. There's another E39, there's an E34 over here. Um, so this person looks like, you know, they've been in the business for a while and they're probably quite familiar with this BMW. Also, an interesting option here, you can see in the trim, these circles tell me that this car has park distance control. Uh, not too many cars um, have that. This has the later sport seats with the adjustable thigh bolster. You can see the sport steering wheel here with the round airbag. I can even see in the top corner here um, of this photo that there's a sunshade hanging down, which is um, a nice option to have as well. Okay, well, this looks like it also has the fold down rear seats, which is a must have option in my opinion. Um, you can see the handles here in this photo. Uh, looks like they have the VIN number here, which is nice. Um, you don't always see that. It's actually pretty common to not get a VIN number, and that is something that I always like to ask for. And what you can do is we'll just cut and paste the last seven digits of this VIN number. So let's copy. Just Google search BMW VIN decode. go here. There's a bunch of VIN decoders online which will tell you all of the options. We'll paste this in. No, I'm not a robot. Okay, now here's the full VIN. 
Um, it'll tell you all of the information you want to know. Here's the color, um, Alpine Weiss 3, automatic transmission, shadow line trim, M Sport suspension, M leather steering wheel. Um, I also like to see, oh, here, here you go. Here's roller sun visor, rear lateral. Um, the through loading system, that means this, the back seats fold down. This has sports seat. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, this has a uh, DSP sound, which is great. Park distance control, as I predicted. Uh, it has the rain sensing uh, wi windshield wipers, which is awesome. Um, that's definitely an option that you want. Xenon is also an option you always want to have. Um, I didn't see, did I see heated seats in here yet? All right, well, let's go back to the listing here. Um, there doesn't appear to be any proper photo of the driver's side controls. So I can't really see here uh, if there's a seat heating button. Um, so that's unfortunate. If it didn't have heated seats, that would be a no-go for me. Personally, that's like a non-negotiable. But hopefully this video just shows you, um, you know, how I look at a car quickly and evaluate them. So let's do one more. Let's go back. Um, here's one for $2,000. Salvage title, okay. So I'm glad I saw this one. When I see salvage title, I'll immediately just go back. I don't mess with that. Um, here's another one, 2001, black. Now this looks interesting. Here's an example of a car that has sport package wheels. Uh, those look like M parallels, and it has the chrome trim around the window. So you know this is not a true sport package car, and as a result, um, unfortunately, the value will always be a bit lower. Uh, also looks like they modified the exhaust over here, which could be a good or bad thing. Another good indicator to look at is the brand of tire. Um, if you have a good quality name brand tire, like, like even a Yokohama, or Continental or Michelin, um, that sort of serves as an indicator of did the, peop the person who owned the car have enough money to properly maintain it and put quality parts and tires on the car. If you see these uh, kind of no-name Chinese tires on the car, it's usually an indicator that um, they really didn't maintain the car as well as they could have um, and we're, put, we're compromising the car by putting um, really cheap aftermarket Chinese parts on the car. So you've done all of your research, you've narrowed down the field, and you've decided to go look at some cars. That's great. So the next step you need to do is make sure that the number one rule is to meet in a public space. Uh, you don't wanna to go to someone's house. You don't wanna give your address to meet someone at, at your house or where you live. The best thing you can do is to meet at a grocery store or somewhere public like a Home Depot, a home improvement store where there's gonna be um, lots of other people around um, just for your safety. The next step, um, you wanna make sure that you're not looking at the car at night. This one might seem obvious, but even when I've sold cars in the past, I've had people asking me, well, hey, when I get out of work, can I come see the car? And uh, when they get out of work, it's maybe six o'clock. And in the winter time now, it gets dark and around 4.30 or five. So um, it'd be impossible for them to properly assess the car and look at it. Um, when it's raining out, you also don't wanna look at a car. Um, those are just the ground rules to start. Now, when you finally meet up with the seller of the car, um, introduce yourself, make some small talk, um, sort of get to know the vibe of the person and see if that person's, you know, someone you're comfortable doing business with or even getting in the car with them and going on a test ride. Uh, you don't want to just meet up and, you know, jump right in the car. Uh, there has to be a little bit of getting to know each other first. Um, so take five minutes to walk around the car and check everything out. Um, talk to the seller about uh, why they're selling the car. That's a good question to ask in person. Uh, I don't like to ask that one over email, but I'll always ask it in person, you know, make some good eye contact and see uh, what their response is and if they're going to be honest about um, the true reasons of why they might be selling their car. After talking to the seller of the car for a few minutes, the first thing I like to do is walk around the exterior and check everything out, see if there's any dents, 
um, if there's any rust spots. The E39s are known for some spots, like usually around here, especially in New England and the Ice Belt. Um, down in the lower rocker areas, there will be some rust. Um, there's not really rust around the front fenders, but uh, those are the areas. Um, I'll also open up all of the doors. And one of the things I like to do is get down low here and I'm gonna look around that bottom edge of the door. This is a very common spot for rust bubbles to form. And what I'll do is just lift up this rubber trim piece here and f rub my fingers underneath all along the entire run of the door and feel for rust bubbles. And you can look in there and see if there's any rust forming. You'll also check out the back. Uh, we'll do the same exact thing. Look underneath here, feel for rust bubbles under that bottom edge of the door. Uh, this car has no rust under these doors, which is really nice. And yeah, we'll generally just walk around the car first, check everything out. Another common spot on these cars is right here. Sometimes rust forms along this edge. Um, previous cars I've had, one had a rust hole right here that I repaired, and another one had a bubble right here under this um, rubber seal, and it seems to be pretty common on these cars. Again, on this other side, we'll check and see if there's any rust along here. You can put your hand in along the arch here and check for rust and rot. The next step here, open up the gas door. Let's see if there's any rust bubbles right here. Almost every E39 I've ever owned um, had a rust spot right here. Um, so don't let that deter you. It's not that big of a deal, even if the rest of the car is really nice. Um, almost every one I've had has had some small rust bubble right here. And for some strange reason, this car does not have one. Again, when you open up the next door, go ahead and uh, what I like to do is run my hand along um, the door jam here and feel for any paint lines. Sometimes if a car was painted and poorly refinished, um, you'll be able to feel a tape line from where they taped off uh, the jam right here and there will be a, an edge that you can feel. Um, this car doesn't have it because it hasn't been painted, but I helped my brother-in-law look for a car once. Um, I think it was last year and the first door that I opened I was able to feel right here and I knew that the car had been painted. Once again, move on to the next door and we'll lift up this rubber seal and feel under here for rust bubbles. And finally, we'll check out this door here. Now that we've given the car a good walk around here, um, now we can get into some of the finer details. One of the things you can do is check the VIN number and right in here under the driver's side of the car, let's see if we can get this to focus. Behind the windshield, there's a small window that will expose the VIN number. So I would check the VIN number there. And if I zoom out here, you can see its location on the car. It's right under here. Open up the door here and you can verify that the VIN number matches here on the sticker on the door jam. This also will tell you other information like the production date, December 2001. And you can get the last seven digits here for your VIN decoding, which hopefully you already did before you ever came out to see the car. Now the next thing I do on my list here is I'll lift up these floor mats and move these out of the way. And I'll feel with my hand and check to see if the carpet is wet or sometimes if they've been wet for a while, you'll see some um, mold and um, some other nasty stuff growing in the car. So definitely feel, put some pressure on here and see if um, there's any moisture. That can be an indicator of one or two things. Either the sunroof drains are blocked or what's more common on the E39 is the vapor barrier behind the door has failed and is allowing water to leak into the car. The other thing you can do while you're in here is if you have fold down seats, 
or any other features. Um, go ahead and open them up. Uh, make sure everything works. You can check out the condition of the leather. Um, I also take a look at the headliner to see if there's any stains or rips. Another area you want to take a good look at is in the trunk. We'll open up our CD changer area over here. Uh, make sure there's nothing weird going on. You can also check out the age of the battery here. We'll open that guy up. And this battery does actually happen to be pretty old. Um, this one says 2010, and you can usually check the date code here on the battery, and that will tell you um, just exactly when the last time that battery was replaced. So this one's going on 10 years, and it's probably going to need replacement soon, so I'm not stranded in those winter months. We'll also open up the spare. As you can see, this one matches the other four wheels, and it is a little dirty in here, but I don't see any rust or um, any damage. Sometimes there'll be a huge, uh, you know, gouge here or a crack. Might be an indicator that um, they hit something with the car in the past and then swapped the spare wheel on uh, for the damaged wheel. You know, that's pretty common as these cars get up in age. Not a deal breaker, but something to take note of. Now another thing to notice when buying one of these cars is I like to see a carpet back here that's really clean. Um, if there's all sorts of stains and tears and rips, um, you can tell the car might have had a little bit of a hard life and it hasn't been you know, taken care of as well as it should have been. Um, the cleaner the car and the interior is generally an indication that it was driven carefully and taken care of. Next you might want to open up the trunk toolkit here and see if anything is missing. Generally speaking, everything here should look pretty good. Um, if anything is rusty, um, this is not really a problem on the E39, but um, on other models, sometimes if the tools are rusty here, um, it's an indicator that there might have been a leak, um, which is kind of strange, but make sure all of your tools are there. Once again, let's come into the back here. I will lift up this floor mat, tuck it under. Um, make sure you feel around here, see if anything is wet, and if there's any um, kind of issue that may indicate that the vapor barrier has failed or there might be a sunroof, um, sunroof leak issue. Again, on the passenger side, let's lift up that floor mat. Um, you can even take the whole thing out and look and see just how clean it is under here. And the cleaner it is underneath the floor mat um, is usually an indicator that the car was taken, um, someone took good care of it. And if you see all sorts of stains and, you know, crayon and food and all sorts of nasty stuff in here, usually tells you that the car was abused a little bit and it may not be as clean as you had hoped for. Now let's talk about seat twist. Seat twist is a common E39 issue, and this car is no exception. Um, seat twist is when some of the cables that control the seat movement shrink over time, um, and the housing of that cable causes the seats, uh, the mechanisms, not to function properly. And as a result, only one side will adjust, leaving the other not to adjust as much, and the whole seat will twist in different ways and I'll demonstrate that now. Now as you can see here, this has caused a, a twisting. You can see all these ripples in the leather here. And when I adjusted that seat, the left side moved in more than the, than the right side. And that is a pain to fix. It's not Again, not a deal breaker if you're looking for one of these cars. Let's adjust it back. Now it's okay. Let's show you again one more time. You can hear that twisting. And the whole side of the headrest is, um, is twisted too. Now what's interesting is after owning several different E39s over the past six years, 
uh, maybe going on seven years now, um, you can see that the seat twist issue tends to be more common in the 2002 and 2003 model year. Um, I've had a few 2001 models and I've never seen the seat twist in those. So maybe they changed suppliers for the cables at some point and that resulted in this sort of mass uh, widespread problem with the seat twist. But in order to resolve that issue, um, you can either replace the cables, which are about $100, or you can just remove the seat and um, trim those the housing on those cables, and that will resolve the issue for, um, for free. And it will take you a couple hours per side. Um, it's kind of a pain, but again, if the car is really nice, um, not a deal breaker to have twisted seats. Um, it's very common in the E39. And let's not forget to check under the hood. No inspection would be complete without doing that. Now taking a look under the hood um, can tell you a lot of different things. Uh, one of the most interesting things um, I can come up with to share is that um, there's always a production date stamp on a lot of the plastic parts and right here you can see um, this round circle molded into this plastic hose and in the center it says 13 and that tells you that the last time the cooling system may have been replaced or at least this um, some of the hoses was 2013. Now it's 2019 so that is getting on in age and it, might be, it may be an indicator for you uh, to do some detective work uh, just to show you, uh, you know, when some maintenance was done. Another thing to look for on these cars is the ABS module right here on the passenger side of the car. Um, if you see a sticker here, um, this one has been rebuilt. Um, that's a good indicator too um, that tells you someone took care of the car. Um, it's already had the issue with the ABS module failing and someone has taken care of that. Um, if there's no sticker, uh, I guess changing out that ABS module is likely in your future. But again, not a deal breaker. To have that done is about $100. Now, if you're curious what color your car is, you can always look under the hood here and see if I can get this. Under the hood should be the paint code. This is Dunkel Blau or Toledo Blau Metallic, which is known as Toledo Blue. And there should be some stickers here. If you don't have stickers uh, or they're missing, it may be an indicator that um, the hood has been replaced and painted and whatever body shop did the work, maybe they were a little um, lazy and didn't replace those stickers. So if you have stickers here, um, that's always a, a good sign that you know the, the paint may be original. Um, some good body shops will replace those stickers, so it's not foolproof, but it is something to note. Again, on the passenger side of the car here, you can just look around, make sure nothing's broken, everything is in place. Um, again, here's where the VIN number is. You can see that window in the windshield. That's by the driver's side of the car. And you want to check, of course, check that VIN number. Make sure it matches um, the information that you received before going to look at the car. Again, with the production date code, what's interesting is you should be able to find a production um, code on the headlight as well. And here it is right here. It's probably not gonna show up on camera, but um, this one says 09. And obviously this car was made in 2002. So that tells you that maybe around 2009 or 2010, um, this headlight was replaced. Um, the fender does look to be repainted on this car. So there was a minor fender bender in the past where this headlight was replaced, um, this fender was repainted, and again, their production date codes is a way that you can do some detective work and find out um, what may be original to the car and what has been replaced. On the E39, there's also a hidden function where you can use your remote to put all the windows down and the sunroof open at the same time by just holding the up button on the key. So let's hold this down and see if it works. All right, let's see if we can put all the windows 
back up. There we go, windows are up, sunroof is closed. And we did that just by putting the key into the driver's door uh, lock cylinder and turning it clockwise so that it locks and everything goes back up. Now the final thing you want to check before your test drive for safety is go ahead and feel the tires. Make sure that um, there's ample tread on here. I'll also um, usually have a flashlight with me and I'll shine in through the wheel, take a look and see the condition of the brake rotors and the brake pad. Uh, make sure that there's enough meat left on there. Sometimes the brake rotor will have a huge um, a lip on it or like an edge or some grooves in it. That tells you the pads are really worn. Um, you're going to have to assume it's going to need a brake job pretty soon. Um, but the brake rotors and pads look okay on this. Uh, the front tires are new on this car and um, we'll also check them in the back. So I'll go ahead and take a look at the rotors in the back here. Uh, make sure there's some tread on the tires and um, yeah we're good to go. All right now it's time for the test drive and what you want to do here is test out all the electronics. Um, test the heated seats, make sure they work. Uh, sometimes they don't. Um, you can turn the traction control on and off. Um, make, sure, make sure all the buttons are working. Um, try the radio. Um, this applies to you know all other types of models of BMW. Always check the radio because some of them um, have issues where the amplifier in the trunk will go bad and you won't have any sound. Um, this one does have sound, it is working. But if you're not getting any sound from the radio, it could be an indicator of a larger problem. So you know never take anything um, at face value. You always have to check yourself, um, make sure everything is working. Now on the dashboard, this is also going to give you some information, such as make sure you put gas in the car before making a YouTube video. But you'll also see um, if there's a service engine soon light on. Just because there isn't one doesn't mean that the seller didn't uh, erase it before you came to see the car, which is um, highly frowned upon, but it does happen. So what I like to do is I will always bring a scan tool with me, and um, this is the Creator C310. You can bring whatever tool you have with you. And um, even if there is no service engine soon illuminated, um, if there is a problem, sometimes it will be stored in the computer as a shadow code for a while. So bring this with you, scan the car thoroughly, and see if there's any um, hidden problems or um, problems that the seller either didn't know about or um, intentionally didn't want to disclose to you. So. The more tools you have at your disposal, uh, the better off you'll be. Now one of the nice things about um, driving around a parking lot that is poorly paved or driving over speed bumps is you can really feel the clunk in either the ball joints are clunking or sometimes, sometimes it's not a ball joint, sometimes it's actually a uh, sway bar link in the front. Um, I've had cars in the past that I could have sworn the ball joints were bad and it turned out to be a sway bar link causing clunking which would be much easier to change and on the E39 there's something like $24 each and um, yeah super easy to replace. So I would recommend um, driving it around wherever there's speed bumps or maybe a road that isn't perfect. Um, that will definitely shine some light on the suspension clunking and give you an indicator you know, if any of the ball joints or sway bars um, need to be replaced. That concludes my E39 buyer's guide. If you have any questions, please leave them for me in the comments below. You can also send me an email, which is in the description box below. And if this video was helpful to you, please click the like button, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.